Hello, my name is Claire O'Mahony. I run a Master's in the History of Design here at the Department for Continuing Education at the University of Oxford. I've been invited to give a little talk to you and I've given it the title Tableware Tales. It's the story of two plates, this pretty little porcelain cake plate and a dinner plate called the Arabian Ware. This is a story of creativity and industry, all coming from the heart of England, the Midlands, the county of Staffordshire. Ceramics are one of the most ancient forms of creative production. Whether it's the red clay of Africa or the mixtures of bone and porcelain that you have coming from China as early as the 17th century, traded by the Dutch, collected by the world. Objects for use, as well as ceremonial items, ceramics are part of our cultural heritage and part of our everyday life. Looking at them is a core dimension of the history of design. There are many skills that we use to explore the histories of material culture, and in this talk, I hope to demonstrate some of how those ways of researching work in our field through the study of these two plates. One of the things I enjoy most about being a design historian is that the core evidence that we use is the materiality of objects, the sensorial experience of things and places. To understand this pot, one needs to think about how it was made, and traces of that are inscribed on its surface, in its weight, in the way it pours. You reimagine the process of it being made on a potter's wheel as your hand runs over the surface and you feel that gradient. You reenact the touch of a small tool as your thumb runs along the surface of that bottom lip. You understand that glaze creates a very different sensation to the roughness of the basic stoneware of a pot. Sensorial history tells us wonderful features about how the object was made, how it was used, and how we might understand it as a historical trace of lived experience. Now, William Morris advises us, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. So a lot of what I want to talk to you about today are the ways in which these objects serve those two goals. They're things that are both every day, we eat off them, we entertain with them, but they're also part of how we project our sense of self. The beautiful things around us define us as well as enrich our daily life. So how might one go about researching a plate or a bowl or any kind of everyday object? Well, design history has tended to cluster its ways of working around these three core ideas, production, consumption and mediation. Production is the world of imagination as well as practicality. It's everything from the initial sketch, the preliminary process of moulding or throwing, right the way through to creating formal moulds and serial manufacture of hundreds of products. Now consumption is part of the process of production. You need to be imagining the person who might buy or own your object as you design it and manufacture it. So those two circles very much intersect. And indeed, mediation is a lot of how those two worlds collide. How do we convince each other that this is the perfect dinner plate to have to entertain? What are the tastes that are disseminated across a generation around the world? This is often conveyed and promoted by a set of influential arbiters of taste. We might find them in the pages of daily newspapers, or in learned volumes in the library, or in current day influences on digital media. 
all of these different orbits touch, though they each have their distinctive properties that I wish to talk with you about today. So let's start with production. How might these two plates have been made? Well, we know they're both from the region known as the Potteries in the Midlands of England. This district of uh, Staffordshire was well known in the 19th century after the legacy of Wedgwood and others who initiate this important ceramics industry, there are a great proliferation of little firms as these two early 20th century photographs show us. The sky was virtually black with all of the coal dust and smoke from all the different pot banks churning away, producing the intensity of heat suitable to harden up biscuit ware and to seal glazes into their permanent rainbow of colours. So a mixture of place of extraordinary creativity, but also quite brutal working conditions of pollution, of hardship at the same time. So I think this mixture of the pleasure of consumption, but also the implications of its production is something that design history is very interested in exploring. So how might we get a glimpse of what it's like to be a Staffordshire potter? Well, 19th century engravings, medical officers' reports, novels set in the region give us a wonderful glimpse of that area. But I also thought it might be entertaining to see a wonderful 1947 film made for the Board of Trade, notionally a kind of documentary film, but really as much a kind of dramatic narrative about Britain coming up from the ashes of the Second World War, reimagining its industries and itself as a hopeful place of the future, whilst also retaining a sense of the world of skills and artistic cultivation and local identity. So Terry Bishop's film is both imaginative and documentary in focus, but I thought it'd be wonderful for you to hear the voices and indeed the local dialects which were used to describe the many different hands that worked to create a beautiful cup in the Staffordshire pottery. Now our protagonists are a young Staffordshire lad who's brought home his prospective bride to meet the Potter family. And I think you get a wonderful glimpse of how differently parts of England understood each other or not from this wonderful conversation scene. Meet you, Gladys. Well, how do you like our smoke? Give her a chance, Aunt Flora. She hasn't been here five minutes. You know, that's the first question they always ask in the pot is how do you like our smoke? I always say it makes you feel at home. It's all right for you, Bert Harkett. You don't have to do the washing and the cleaning up. Have you heard any of our pottery's talk yet, Gladys? Go on, Mabel. Koska Kaboga and a woman, you had to do the boss. <laughs> eh? <laughs> <laughs> what she means is, can you kick a ball against a wall and head it till you burst it? <laughs> <laughs> Take no notice of them, Gladys. They're kidding you. Here, get that down, you. Yeah. Oh, what a smashing cup. You never see anything like that in London. Ah, wait a minute. There's a cells down at our place. I reckon we all had a hand in it one way or another. All of you? Well, all the time, he works for another firm. But there's Mabel here, she's a fat little handler. Ada's a painteress. Mum's a cup jollier and I'm a slippers man. What about me, Bert Alkit? I'm a putter-up duck. Putter-up? Fat little handler, cup jollier? What funny names. Whatever do they mean? What is she, Gladys? Teacher Gladys. So to make these beautiful plates, all kinds of different skills are required. And I don't expect to be able to explain to you all those different talented people who make different stages of the production process. But I thought you might like to see just one little clip of how plates are moulded and turned, a wonderful mixture of handicraft and machinery from this 1935 film, which is very much a documentary film, it's silent, Clay Hands and Fire at the Spode Works. And this is a process called jiggering, which is how plates are moulded.
And I think what both of those uh, films showed us is that extraordinary crossroads at which ceramics exist. They're both very much a world of individual expression, but also of serial manufacture. And I think that's a, an issue that's as present in their decoration as it is in the forming of the moulding of the actual plate itself. Now, each of these plates are made in a process known as transfer. And that's where you take a piece of paper, ink up a copper plate with this very delicate design inscribed within it. The ink gets embedded in the paper. The paper is then embedded onto the biscuit ware. And that allows you to have a pattern that is ready made, as it were, to then be retouched in the plate on the right with gilt work with flashes of yellow and purple. The plate on the left, the little cake plate, very much in that grand tradition of blue and white ware, is a process called flow blue. So instead of the very sharply defined edges that were very much prized in the 18th century, it became very popular in the 19th century to add just a touch of lime in the process of applying a transfer to get this sort of soft, blurred edge. Now, just to give you a flavour of how transfer process works, I'm going to show you two little clips from a wonderful set of films by a Chinese ceramic historian and maker, Derek Ao, who kindly gave me permission to show you these little sequences out of 72 hands, where we see the application of underglazed transfers at the Guangming porcelain factory, and then the tearing away of the paper. And I think they give a wonderful sense of the sounds of a manufactory, which are just as evocative as the wonderful Staffordshire dialects we just heard. Now, having put on those bits of paper with such delicacy, you now quickly strip them away. So having got a real sense of how the general processes of making ceramic plates and cups operates, let's have a little think about the two particular firms who made our two tableware pieces. On the left, you see the mark on the back of the little blue and white plate uh, from a firm called Addersley. And on the right, the mark for William Brownfield, both two important Staffordshire firms that have worldwide reputations as well as local workforces. Addersley takes over the direction of a, a set of multiple firms that had made a conglomerate in the 1870s and it becomes uh, Adderley. It then becomes Adderley & Co. And they reside at the Daisy Bank Works in Longton. And I think the advertising that you see in the top right of the slide, as well as the trademarks, give us a sense of an ambitious firm. They have a clipper ship showing that complex backwards and forwards dialogue between learning the processes of the recipes for porcelain and this blue and white pattern making that was so famously from China, but then reversing that trade and selling ceramics to the world. Brownfield <coughs> leaves traces of his Staffordshire identity in his very trademark. The belt form is evocative of the Staffordshire knot that appears on some of his earlier pieces. And indeed, Brownfield's a visible trace on the district of uh, Handley within the great Staffordshire towns. In 1859, Brownfield was elected mayor and as his gift to the municipality for entrusting their future to him, he provides the central square with a drinking fountain. 
He tops it with a figure of the Roman goddess Temperantia, encouraging the good people and townsfolk of Hanley to imbibe water, perhaps more than visiting the alehouse. I think it's worth remembering the heat of the conditions of pot banks. There was an anxiety about temperance that does underlie a lot of manufacturing. He also donates a working men's library to Handley. So he's very committed to having an educated, uh, a well-provided workforce. And that's a source of great public concern in the Victorian age, given factory working conditions were often quite brutal. And indeed, when William Brownfield becomes Brownfield and Sons, his younger son, Arthur Brownfield, argues in the 1890s that they should become a guild pottery instead. And that's where it becomes a sort of cooperative enterprise where both skilled craftspeople and the management collaborate on pricing, on the artistic vision of the firm. I'm afraid William Brownfield's father had an enormously successful business employing over 600 people. By the time we get to the 1890s, the guild is quite a modest affair and the firm closes its doors in the early de days of the 20th century. So scale is not always on a uh, vast um, stage. But interesting that we can get a sense of different ways of creating uh, ceramic works for different kinds of audiences. So who were the audiences, the consumers of these beautiful plates? Well, I'm just showing you here in, uh, a photograph of a late Victorian interior. This one happens to be from Wales, but I think is evocative of the kinds of spaces that these plates were intended to inhabit. They're put in pride of place on a dresser, accompanied by glassware and pieces of pewter or silver. They have as much presence and prestige as the paintings and portraits, the grandfather clock and the barometer on the wall. They are all purveyors of a sense of dwelling, belonging and identity. So what might have led people to choose? a Brownfield of Cobridge paint, such as this one. Well, let's get a little sense of what the firm's reputation was in the 19th century, as well as now. A good place to start is always a visit to the museum. And happily, as one starts to look through the uh, digital catalogues of key institutions like the V&A, Brownfield pops up quite regularly. Interestingly, the V&A in London holds principally his jug collection. There are a few little uh, figurines and there's a teapot, but had one stopped one's research just with the V&A, the sense of the firm might have been that they were just uh, creators of jugs and, and more uh, decorative pieces of uh, tableware. I'm just showing you a close up here of three of the V&A jugs. First of all, to draw your attention to the canniness of William Brownfield, he patented his designs and thereby ensured they were protected from industrial espionage. But he also was very clever in thereby creating very careful design patterns, which could be replicate, replicated in different colorways. I'm also including the trio of jugs that all won uh, honourable mention, if not medals, at the 1862 International Exhibition in London. Now, if we look at the base of uh, the Muse's Blue Jug, which Brownfield specially makes to commemorate that important exhibition, the one where the medieval court inspires William Morris and Burne Jones to become arts and crafts makers. On the base of the jug, you see the Staffordshire Knot. Again, Brownfield proudly declaring this to be a product of that region. But it's also emblazoned with the word international to alert us both to the fact that this was an object shown in that exhibition and the ambitions of the firm to reach a world stage. Now, what do we know about the reputation of Brownfield in the 19th century? Well, he makes the cut of being mentioned with uh, considerable praise by Jewett, one of the early 
uh, Victorian historians of the ceramic art of Great Britain. And in this passage from the 1883 edition of that study, we're alerted to the fact that Brownfield's printed patterns are well designed, they are placed on better classes of goods, their enamelic and gilding was very effective. We're also made uh, confident in our uh, investigative study from sensorial observation that the print design was indeed colour over by hand. So it's a mixture of craft and transfer process. We've got a list of all the different kinds of objects that Brownfield makes, but also uh, a celebration of their large home trade as well as export to Denmark, France, Holland, Russia, Italy, Spain, Portugal and the United States. The manufacturing was very extensive. So museums, primary sources describing the different manufacturers, but also the traces of these objects in these different world exhibitions. And I'm just including here a glimpse of one of the great Paris exhibitions but also a list on the left hand column of all these different international fairs where Brownfield makes a splash, winning prizes or securing uh, important press coverage. It includes Sydney, Calcutta, Philadelphia. The Pottery Gazette in 1879 declares Brownfield to be a trendsetter in dinner service design. So that despite the fact the V&A didn't collect any of those dinner service plates, such as the Arabian one that we have, it clearly was hugely important in a Victorian perception of what good Staffordshire ware was. And I think a lot of objects drop out of the historical record. I just draw your attention to this last point. There was an 11 foot earth vase made by Brownfield and Sons, which attracted over 25,000 people when it was shown in Staffordshire and went on to be displayed at Crystal Palace in 1884. But the only trace that survives of it is a set of articles in popular press of the 1880s and a world press. It's not just the Birmingham Daily Post, the Manchester Weekly Times, it's also uh, drawing attention to by the New York Herald, Bull's China Shop, a creditable exhibit at the British Porcelain at the Champ de Mars in Paris, and indeed a French publication called Modern Construction admires the engineering ingenuity and artistry of the earth bars. Now, we've looked at museums, we've looked at secondary scholarship, we've considered popular press. The firm also had recourse to self-promotion through advertising. I'm just showing you here an example of a little illustrative branding item that you could find in the pages of the Pottery Gazette. So how is Brownfield and Sons of Cobridge inviting us to understand what we're buying from them? Well, they alert our attention to the fact that they are a Staffordshire pottery, a world-renowned centre of ceramic production. They have showrooms in London on Holborn Circus, but they also have agents in New York. So they're world players. You buy a piece of their ceramic, you're becoming part of a set of uh, discerning purchases worldwide. We've also got the honourable mention of the medals literally inscribed into the surface of the advert. People in Sydney and London and Paris have all thought these were prize winning objects. The names of the different dinner service patterns also signal that worldwide reputation and imaginative voyage. Do you see yourself as eating off a plate inspired by Ningpo in China or Madras in India. Perhaps you're an American and wish to see a Wisconsin landscape or an English table decorated with medieval or pastoral pastimes. Even the graphic design of this little advertising illustration gives us a glimpse of the multiple uh, stylistic skills that Brownfield and Sons could boast. 
You've got Gothic Revival script in the initial letter for Brownfield. You have Japanese cherry blossoms growing over the edge of this uh, beautiful historicist border. Now, this sense of a world trade was something that was readily admired by a number of discerning critics of the day. And I'm just showing you here a little article out of the Art Journal by James O'Fallon which praises Brownfield, not just for their inspiring pattern making, but their recognition of the different social habits in different national cultural traditions. O'Fallon alerts us that uh, Brownfield are uh, busy catering for American requirements, which differ somewhat from English in a few particulars. For instance, their dinner services seldom include terrines and vegetable dishes of the same material. It is being recognised rule for these to be in silver, which costs a little more, and indeed sometimes less than richly decorated porcelainous articles of the kind favoured in the mother country. Sometimes even when Miss Chance has dealt hardly with their handles and knobs. The tea sets, as in general use, also differ. So Brownfield is recognised. It's worth designing different kinds of tableware services to reflect the different dining habits and conventions of prospective buyers on either side of the Atlantic. And I think that's where pattern and form are so wonderfully managed by the Brownfield firm. Now, the V&A failed us in terms of trying to get a sense of the variety of patterns that have been made by the Brownfield firm. Our advert gave us a little glimpse of the fact that there were a huge variety of different aesthetic tastes being catered for. Now, a little trip down to a market stall, an auction house or a digital marketplace, as I'm showing you here, demonstrates the extraordinary geographical variety of imaginative voyages that we were invited to consider purchasing. If you're drawn to an English tradition or tasteful pass, you might pick Shakespeare or York or a set of medieval scenes. If you're going out to a colonial postings, perhaps you might choose the Star of India or Inkerman. Or maybe you're drawn to classical antiquity, Palmyra in the top right. Or maybe you fancy European flavours of Nice, Verona or Denmark. So pattern making is part of how we project our sense of self and Branfield's offering an extraordinary variety of different identities. Now, how does one discern what those identities are and which one suits us best? Well, this is where our third term of mediation comes into play so richly. Now, mediation, I think, has often traditionally been understood as learned people, whether that's Nicholas Pevsner's guides to the different counties of Britain or Jewett telling us about what good ceramics are in Victorian Britain. But what I also hope to have demonstrated to you is that quite modest publications, daily provincial newspapers like the Birmingham Daily Post, often reveal quite thoughtful considerations of the roles that ceramics play in our daily life. So I'm including here an image of the former uh, offices of the Birmingham Daily Post, but also alongside it, a little cartoon by the great punch uh, illustrator Georges Dumoyer, which both celebrates but mocks this role of the aesthetic arbiter of taste. A young uh, enfianced couple look at a beautiful six mark teapot, a blue and white teapot, and the aesthetic bridegroom declares, it is quite consummate, is it not? And his intense bride replies, it is indeed, oh Algernon, let us live up to it. So taste is something one must aspire to. So what taste does our Arabian plate suggest? Well, it's very much of its age, 
the, the dating on the back, WB, alerts us to the fact that it was manufactured between 1850 and 1871. It demonstrates that global perspective of Britain operating on a world stage, drawn to the historic ornament of the gifted Arabian iconoclastic tradition. And it also shows to us that it's part of a whole set of wares that were greatly admired at these international exhibitions. And this is just to remind you of that London show of 1862 and sort of cacophony of ware that critics were trying to navigate and alert us to which ones were the good ones to buy for home. Now, I'm just giving you here a floor plan of that interior, so we see where we might have glimpsed our Arabian plate, and also two examples of sort of more high-end voices in the mediation of ceramics at the 1862 exposition. The catalogue for the exhibition itself alerts us to Brownfield's dinner services as being a novelty, a particular service had drawings by H.K. Brown, better known as Fizz, who is justly celebrated for his amusing sketches. The subjects in the centres are of a great variety and the engravings are executed in the best style. Now, John Stewart, writing in the Art Journal, again, a kind of high-end publication, also draws our attention to William Brownfield of Cobridge, Staffordshire, whose contributions of earthenware are varied and of high order. They consist principally of household utilities, breakfast, tea and dinner services of good patterns, chamber services. But Brownfield exhibits also objects of a meritorious art character, ornamental as well as useful, for the drawing or dining room. Mr Brownfield has fully earned the honour he has received. Now, those high-end uh, commentators give us the very brief and arty, if you will, perspective on ceramic production from Staffordshire. The Birmingham Daily Post, interestingly, as a provincial correspondent, has perhaps a more local and perhaps more pragmatic sense of what the readership might want to know. What would it be like to own one of these jugs or plates? How might they be used daily? Well, our correspondent at the Post argues Mr. Brownfield exhibits some good jugs, but the frosted or matted surface which relieves the ornamentation in the hands of slovenly servants is liable to hold dust, which is not at all times removed. The forms of the jugs are good and internally admit of being easily cleansed, a great recommendation. We rather think that art, music and science and commerce are out of place on a jug. I think that wonderful down-to-earth tone is indicative, however, also of a great understanding that ceramics are everyday objects. Look at how he describes the fern vase, an old jug, and gives us a sense of where it lets us down in terms of practicality. The jug, the fern jug, is marred by the introduction of the acanthus leaf. The rope handle is a mistake. Ropes are not rigid and could not retain the form given in the example alluded to. The appropriate ornamentation of common wares is much to be desired. This exhibitor has got hold of some good ideas and it is because we recognise this that we have here directed special attention to his wares. So there is a kind of wonderful mixture of commendation and slight grudging criticism. I think I was drawn to the fern jug precisely because of this textural richness. I love the fact that the Staffordshire knot, which is the emblem of the county, but also the insignia of the firm, is literally uh, forming the shape of the handle as well as incised in the bottom of the jug but our practical correspondent the Daily Post alerts us to the fact that if it was full of a, of a liquid like ale or water for flowers, it might make it clumsy and risk breakage. So don't be always purely attentive to 
London Voices and Elite Arbiters of Taste, our Daily Post pragmatic, pragmatic correspondent, has alerted us to many thoughtful things. He goes on to talk about the Fizz dining service that was so admired by the London critics. And a very different perspective emerges again. A dinner service with a well-designed ornament which does not obtrude itself by meandering over the whole surface, but is confined to the edge of the plates and the swell of the larger dishes, showing itself distinctly but not obtrusively, is very excellent. The terrine in vegetable dishes are very successful in form. This is a class of work which may be said to be just what is wanted, the ornamentation being chaste and simple and in keeping with the use of the various articles. Though the examples of this serious service are decorated with the turquoise and mosaic, touched up with gold, printed in one colour they would look equally well. This style of ornamentation is far better than that on the surface on which Fizz has exercised his genius. Partially clothed females and scantily dressed cupids don't look nice when seen through oxtail soup or their forms partially obliterated by roast mutton and vegetables. Now these critiques I think give us a sense of the many different people who created who mediated, who purchased and lived with our two plates. Now the blue and white plate, I think it has a whole other set of rich associations and connotations. To purchase blue and white ware was to position oneself as an aesthete in the 19th century. As we discern from this uh, wonderful portrait in the arts Institute of Chicago by James McNeil Whistler. He stares beadily at us with his bohemian cravat surrounded by muses in white gowns and kimonos. A wall of blue and white wear on the wall behind tells us that he is an arbiter of taste and distinction. A slightly more comical meditation on that uh, aesthetic quality of blue and white wear is indicated by this programme for Gilbert and Sullivan's comic operetta, Patience, a blue and white plate decorated with a whole set of fey aesthetes in knickerbocker trousers with little figure heads very much evoking the curly hair of Whistler that we just saw in his self-portrait and the sunflowers surrounding it of Oscar Wilde tell us that Blue and white wear is a hallmark of these artistic bohemian temperaments. Gilbert and Sullivan's the fav famous operetta, but I'm just also showing you here, there was even a, a less long lived production called The Willow Pattern, also produced at the Savoy, which you also see a caricature for a willow pattern maiden. Let us also not forget that willow pattern blue and white wear was the service used in the Willow Tea Rooms, uh, wonderfully designed by Charles Rennie Mackintosh for Miss Cranston as part of her temperance initiative, encouraging Glaswegians as they stroll down Socky Hall Street, a Gallic word meaning the Avenue of Willows, to partake of tea rather than the demon drink. Now, just by way of conclusion, I just want to show you a little fragment of an amateur film that was made in 1939 that might give us a glimpse of some of the reasons why my grandparents, when they were marrying in the 1930s, might have been drawn to blue and white wear. How it is something that a society told them was elegant and cultured, but also their hearts told them was evocative of this new married life they were embarking upon. So it's a little animative film, it's called Old China, and it was filmed in 1939 in Hyde. Now it has no sound upon it, but therefore I'll just show you a little tiny clip. But I've given you two stills here to see our two key characters, a young enfianced couple who are walking down the shopping street in Hyde looking for potential wedding presents. 
I don't know whether it's for themselves or for some of their peers who are about to marry. In the shop window, they're cancelled to those about to marry and others. They are advised to partake of free storage and reserve until required. Let us not forget this film is made in 1939. The clouds of war are forming. So let's see how the decision of what to purchase plays out. Our discerning couple decide not to go for a modern shop window. Instead, they enter into an antique shop. Behind them note the willow pattern. They have a look around, the shopkeeper letting them have a wander. Perhaps a Staffordshire figurine was quite pretty. Oh, what about this? What's this for? Clever shopkeeper, I'll come and talk to you now. Let me mediate the meaning. That's genuine willow pattern, madam. And indeed, it does tell a story. Now, the plate uh, that we know so well isn't willow pattern, but it is nonetheless infused with that blue and white romance that the willow pattern evokes. So let us have a quick glance at a little animated sequence at the end of the film, which tells us something of the romance of blue and white wear. Now, the amateur animator has gone for a very glamorous 1930s vision of our young couple. But our hero and heroine on the willow pattern are a mandarin's daughter and a penniless accountant. They've fallen in love and run away, disobeying the wishes of the grand family. And the animation tells us both of the tragedies of impending war as much as this old Chinese tale, but also of potential happy endings. So our lovers sit in their hideaway singing happily until one day The wicked Mandarin sets fire to their idyll. But all is not lost. As the idyll burns, magically the two lovers are transfigured, becoming a pair of doves to fly away unharmed, to live happily ever after. What a lovely story, the couple says. That's the plate for us. And there ends the little imaginative tale with thanks to the Etruria works. Now, what I hope to have shown you is that the most ordinary of plates can tell the most arresting of stories. Study the things around you, see how they define who you are and what identity they project to the world. The most humble of objects tells a glorious tale. Thank you for your attention.